All right, today we're going to continue on in our series. We're going to talk about the power of patience. We're dealing with a series called Building Better Relationships. Bob Goff, an author, said this, God doesn't pass us notes. He gives us each other. Brené Brown, some of you may have read some of her material that she's written. Professor of University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work, specializes in social connections. She said this in an interview. A deep sense of love and belonging is an irresistible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we're meant to. End of quote. We need to talk about relationships today, folks, for three reasons. One, relationships determine our happiness. They're a great source of either great pleasure or great pain, because the thing is, is that when we're in relationships, we have good times and we have bad times. The second thing is our relationships determine our success. The number one important skill that any executive would have of their employees is the ability to get along with each other. Now think of your workplace. Any amens this morning? Rockefeller said he'd pay anything for that one trait that people would be able to get along. The third thing is our relationships develop our character. Who you are a year from today will largely be determined by two things. One, the things that you allow in your mind, because that will shape you. And secondly, the people that you relate to. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, bad company corrupts good character. Last week as I was speaking after the service, one of our members discussed this very point with me. Our kids, when our kids were teenagers, we wanted them to know that we wanted to know who their friends were. In fact, it was always strategic that most times their friends were in our home. What they didn't know was that, that we were watching them. One of the more the one factor more than any others determines the, the future of your success of your children is who they hang with. Don't be overbearing, but uh, but, but don't but uh, be observing. Help them choose which are the right ones, which are not. Because teens, here's what I know: you are who you hang with, and you become who you hang with. I could tell you story after story. Last week, we discussed that the key element in relationship is, well, I'm going to just play that last week's sermon then, if you can't remember. Love. Remember? Love is the aim. Love is the basis of all our relationships. It's our highest aim in life. And today, we're going to look at another characteristic, and that's love is patient. God says that when you're going to relate to people, have big, healthy, growing, good relationships. If you're going to have that, the first thing you you need is patience. Why? Why would God say that we need patience? Well, the the writer of Hebrews recounts the history of Israel under the leadership of Moses, and the author writes these words, but God was patient with them 40 years. Though they tried his patience sorely, he kept right on doing his mighty miracles for them to see. Every morning was manna. But God says, I was very angry with them, for their hearts were always looking somewhere else instead of up to me. For they never found the paths that I wanted them to follow. He's had several thousand years of experience of dealing with people, and he's had to have patience. In the Greek, the word literally means to take a long time to boil. We talk about somebody having a short fuse. This means you've got to have a long fuse. Love is patient. Love means it's, it means that it's loving to be patient, and it's unloving to be impatient. When I'm patient with my wife or with my kids, I'm loving. When I'm impatient, I'm unloving. So why is patience so vital in relationships? When was the last time you ran out of patience? This week. 
Cheryl's not here, I can tell on her. I told her this morning, she, she had to go to sit in the clinic yesterday afternoon. That conjures up all kinds of images, doesn't it? And she got there and they said, well, we'll we, because we live like four minutes away from Italian Center, five minutes away from the clinic. We have it timed. And they said, well, we'll call you when, you're ready, when, when the doctor is ready. So the doctor, or the, the uh, receptionist called my wife called, and said, come on over, we'll get you right in. I got a text every 10 minutes. I'm still in the room. 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 I'm coming home. I said, stay in the room. <laughs> it's always hilarious when we pray, and in the morning before we pray together, especially on Sunday morning, she'll say, well, Bob, what are you preaching on this morning? And I said, you're going to love this. Patience. And she just got, she gave me the look. I said, I'll try not to tell a story on you. But we all have that experience, right? Whether we're in a doctor's office, a dentist's office, getting our license renewed, driving down the road, behind somebody that's going much, much slower than we want them to. This grandmother told this story. I think it's, it's hilarious. Well, I, I don't totally run out of patience, she says, but I'm close. My six-year-old granddaughter was spending a few nights with me, and bedtime is when I need to wind down. Most seniors understand that. But she seems to wind up. So one night we were in the bathroom, and I was trying to get her to brush her teeth. And this, this can take anywhere from two minutes to ten minutes. And she was fooling around, as little kids tend to do, and I said, I'm about at my wit's end with you. She got a very serious look in her eye and gazed at me as she was brushing her teeth. You can see that. You can picture that in your mind. Oh, but bad sign. What's going, in this cute, going on in this cute little head of hers? Next to him, she was waiting for just the right time. We went to the park, and she par we parked the car, and the girls ran out towards the play area, and I felt my phone buzz with an incoming text, and I grabbed it from my pocket and stood there reading the text while she kept saying, Grandma, come on, come on. And then it came. As she stood there with her hand on her hip, Grandma, I'm about at my wit's end with you. <laughs> Boom, right? Out of the mouths of babes. Why do we need patience with each other? Well, glad you asked that question. Let's look at a few reasons. Number one, because everybody's different. Have you ever noticed this past week that others are different than you? Have you noticed? Put up your hand if you notice. You, you notice somebody's different than you, right? If you don't believe me, try going out for lunch or dinner with them and then see if they'll order the exact same thing that you want to order. Many times I like to have some fun with that. I'll say, oh, what do you think, you're, what are you guys going to eat? And, and I think I'm going to pick something and they all pick it and I'll pick something different just to be different. There are no two snowflakes alike and the same is made of us. They're, even among twins, we are, they're different. And since we're different, we're bound to be different in issues and ideas and opinions, and they're going to clash. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 says, God works through different people in different ways. And that's a beautiful thing. I'm so glad that we're different. It's important for us to understand our differences, and you've seen this and you've heard this before, but I want to remind you, I don't tell you this because I just want to fill time. I tell you this because it's important. There's, a, there's an, a, a, an outline of the word shape there. It's important for you to understand your shape. Many of you are more worried about the shape you're in than the shape you have. Some of you will get that tomorrow. All right, here's your unique shape. You've heard this before. The S stands for your spiritual gift. Every believer, every person who's put their trust in Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift, maybe even more. The special abilities that God has given you to serve him and establish a relationship with him. H is for heart. We're all motivated by something differently. We all have different interests. Things that motivate you don't motivate me and vice versa. We all have different heartbeats. And just as unique as our heartbeat is, so are unique are our passions. 
That's why I believe there are people that are passionate about evangelism. They're passionate about worship. They're passionate about discipleship. They're passionate about fellowship. And they're passionate about service. And when we understand what we're passionate about, we don't ever burn out. A stands for abilities. We all have different abilities. Some of you, I've heard, are great with chainsaws out at the campground. Some of you are good with your hands. Some of you can, you're just, just like MacGyver. You can fix anything. Some of you are like MacGyver's mother. You can't fix anything and everything in between. Do you ever think that the abilities that God has given to you are a gift for you to use to serve him? Some of you have the gift and the ability of being with children. Do you ever think that you could use that to influence a child? Serve at our kid venture? I was sitting here this, on, on my driveway up, drive up this morning. I was thinking of the Sunday school teachers that have impacted my life. I can name every one of them. Do you want to have that kind of an impact? That's why God gave you the ability. P is for personality. We all have different personalities. And even, even though there, I believe there are four basic personality types, even the combination, they're never the same. We're all different. That's why there's shy people and there's outgoing people. There are people who like routine. There are people who like variety. People who are introverts, those who are extroverts. Your personality is the way that God's hardwired you. Don't fight it. Embrace it and say, Lord, how can I use this? to serve you. Last one, E is for experiences. We've all got different backgrounds. We've got different needs. There's no one else like you. There's no one else that's experienced life the, like way, the way you have. And your life experiences, as I've shared with you many, many times, your life experience may be the very thing that God wants you to use to help other people go through those life experiences. Because of these five, the way God has shaped you, there is nobody else in the world like you. You are very different, you're very complex, and you're special in the eyes of God. Those of you who took our journey, the partnership, we talked about this, we asked you to fill those things in. I have one shape back. If you haven't filled that out, I want you to fill it out and bring it back to us. We want to help you affirm what your shape is. Let me just give you a little bit of a test of why, how we're different. Is a cup half full or half empty? I could divide the room. We all have different perspectives. Five people at the scene of an accident, and they all see things differently. Five different perspectives. We're all different. Listen to this. Let's just say you had a report card with five A's and one B. You had an A in English and math and history and physics and biology. You had a B in and, 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 and biology, pardon me, and a B in phys ed. Now, if this had been your report card, how would you feel? One of five ways, maybe. I feel good knowing my parents feel good about that too. Or secondly, my parents would want to know why I got a B in that subject. Or I would expect a big reward from my parents if I brought home this card. Or I'd be sad because... I didn't get straight A's. Or maybe you're this one. I'd call CBC News and schedule a press conference. <laughs> We're all different. But here's the second reason why we need patience. Because our differences create misunderstandings. How many of you have ever misunderstood somebody or been misunderstood by somebody? Oh, let's put up both hands. Okay, look at this slide. Why don't you see this slide? <clears throat> a guy who asked the repair garage if they had any 711 for his car. He had no, they had no clue what he was talking about. He insisted he needed 711 urgently, and they would have to have some. They'd never heard of it, so he offered to show them what he meant. See what he sees? It says oil. If you flip it over. 
Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says. No one can really know what anyone else is thinking or what he is really like except the person himself. Would you put a star beside that passage of Scripture? You need to carry that one around. If you want to have patience with somebody, understand that there's no way that you would know what they're thinking. You, there's no way that you know what their motivation is. There's no way that you can understand completely their perspective because you're not them. And no one understands you except you. And even sometimes, we don't even know who we are. See, circle the words, no one. Nobody can understand my wife or husband. If you had my boss, you wouldn't figure him out either. But look at those things. How many have ever used any of these phrases in the last 30 years? I don't understand the way he or she acts, why he or she, she acts that way. She doesn't understand me. He's on a different wavelength than me. She doesn't make any sense. How can you think that way? Or another one, my parents are from another time zone. We all misunderstand one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 says, be patient with one another. Impatience, I shared with you in the text this morning, comes from misunderstandings and misunderstanding comes from four wrong assumptions. This is what I talked about in my text this morning. Don't think you got room for them in your notes, but kind of write them down somewhere. The, the four assumptions are this. Number one, that words mean the same thing to different people. The 500 most used words in the English language have 14,000 different definitions. There's no, one, there's no one word that when we say it, you understand completely what it means. The second assumption is that there's only one way to see things. There wouldn't be any problem if we would just get on my wavelength and you just understand. Remember, women are from Venus and men are from Mars. There's no right way. The third one. Or pardon me, the fourth one. Do you need number three? Oh, then I missed number two. <laughs> Let me start over. This is one of the things I like to... <laughs> I need to tell you a trick about COVID. When we were starting to, to, to uh, videotape our messages and then we would upload them, I could at least go back and go, okay, I'm going to start that over again. And the biggest fear I had going back into in-service places was I couldn't use my rewind button to do it again. <laughs> Just telling you, be patient, will you? Number one, what words mean, that words mean the same thing to different people we've talked about, right? Number two, that there's only one way to see things. That's the one we missed, right? We got that one? Then you missed number three. That my way is the right way to see it. Not only is there only one way, but I've got the right way. And here's the fourth one. I think this one really gets us, especially as Christians, in the ditch. That I can figure out your motivation. I know your motives. You can't understand my motives. People are motivated differently. I can't figure out my own motives, why I do what I do. He says, be patient with everyone. That's impossible you might say. Somebody once said, to dwell above with those we love, that will be glory. To dwell below with those we know, that would be a different story. How can I do it? How can I be patient? Well, God commands us. He doesn't say, I suggested you be patient with everybody. He says, do it. Be patient with everybody. God never tells us to do something without showing us how to do it. So how do we be patient, more patient with people? Number one, remember how patient God is with you. The story is told of a man whose car stalled in heavy traffic at an intersection and the light turned green and all his efforts to start the engine failed and a chorus of honking behind him made matters worse. And finally the man got out of his car and walked back to the first car and said, I'm sorry, I can't seem to get my car started if you go up there and try it, I'll sit here in, in your car and I'll blow the horn for you. <laughs> I 
write this down. I'll say it slowly. You'll never have to be more patient with anybody else than God has been with you. You will never have to be more patient with anybody else than God is and has been with you. Amen? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, in your notes, Paul said, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst sinner, Christ might display his unlimited patience. Friends, Paul was a murderer. When you say to your kids, grow up, Think about what God would like to say to you. Romans 15, 7, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. The motive here is this. The reason I am to accept other people is because God has accepted me. If we were as patient with one another as God is with us, we wouldn't have a tenth of the problems that we have in this world in our relationships. Number one, I remember how patient God is with me. Number two, I learn by listening. How many of you would say your spouse or your best friend is a good listener? Don't put up your hand. That's one of our problems. We don't listen to understand, we listen to respond. We need to listen to understand. A man's wisdom gives him patience, Proverbs 19, 11 says. There's always more to the story. There's always more to, to the reaction. Wisdom gives you more patience. One of our deepest needs is to be understood. Everybody. Paul Tournier, one of the great Swiss psychiatrists, said this, and I quote, No one can fully develop in this world and find a full life without feeling understood by at least one person. No one comes to know himself through introspection or in the solitude of his personal diary. Rather, it is in dialogue with meeting with other people. End of quote. We figure out who we are and who God has made us to be. And that's why we need relationships. Proverbs 18, verse 13 says, listen before you answer. If, if you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. Don't evaluate what you do or what you hear until you've heard it all. God gave us two ears and one mouth. That means we should listen twice as much as we talk. You know this. God made the bullfrog with a muscle that sends a vibration to his brain that cancels out the croaking sound. So when a bullfrog croaks, he can't hear it. The two vibrations cancel out each other. He can't hear the obnoxious sound he's making. When every time he croaks, his brain cancels it out. Here's the principle. It's hard to listen with an open mouth. How would you rate yourself as a listener on a scale of 1 to 10? How would you rate yourself? I read the, of a guy who did an unscientific study at weddings to prove that nobody listens. He went down the receiving line giving a warm smile and saying the alligators are loose. He said everybody gave him a warm smile, looked back and said thank you. One lady, one lady even said, oh, you really think so? I made it myself. We don't listen. We don't listen. Number three, we need to make allowances for each other. It's called PMS. It's the, it's the pre-message syndrome. Some of you will get that later too. <laughs> Ephesians 4, verse 2. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Proverbs 12, 16 in the Good News Version says, smart people will ignore an insult. We've all had bad days, and we're all a little crazy. 
and we need to make allowances for that. Number four, you're doing well. Treat others the way you want to be treated. We've talked about this before. It's the golden rule. Matthew 7, verse 12, always treat others as you would have them treat you. The single verse could save most marriages, most relationships. It's easy to understand, but difficult to practice. And if we could, it would prevent most of the divorces in Canada. We need to treat others like we would be treated. Look at what it says in Philippians chapter 2. None of you should think only of his own affairs, but consider others' interests also. Let your attitude be light, toward life be that of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Could you name the top four or five interests of every member of your family? Sometimes we get so preoccupied with ourselves and so caught up in our own little world. The Bible says that we're to look out at other people's interests and for other people's interests. The Greek word is scopus, literally like telescope, to be aware of. If you care, you'll be aware. You'll be considerate. Let your attitude towards life be that of Christ Jesus. Now, this is the real secret to patience. It's not natural for you. It's not natural for me to be patient with anyone. It takes God's power in your life and in my life. This week, whether at work or school or grocery store, you're going to meet some real jerks. God says to be patient with everybody. Now, how can you be patient with everybody? By having the same attitude as Jesus did. Friends, think of his attitude towards the sick. Think of his attitude towards children. Think of his attitude toward the woman at the well. Think of his attitude towards the woman who was caught in adultery, who we believe was set up, trapped. Think of his attitude, attitude towards Peter when he said, you're going you're gonna to give me up, you're going to deny me. And then when he reinstated him later, think of his attitude towards his mother when he says to John when he's on the cross, mother, behold your son, which basically meant now he'll take care of you. Think of his attitude. And friends, if you want to know how to treat other people, and you want to know how Jesus did it, then read the Gospels and learn how he would go encounter after encounter after encounter with an attitude of love and patience. Let's pray together. As we close, I want you to think of the person that you find difficult to love who irritates and bothers you the most right now. You have an image. It's right there. Or the people that you love but you're still impatient with. You've got a short fuse. Would you say in your heart today, Lord, help me to remember how patient you are with me. Help me to learn about the people I want to have relationships with by listening to them better. Help me to make allowances for other people because of your love. Help me to treat others this week the way that I'd like to be treated. And then consider committing in your heart these words. Lord, I'm going to make this week take time to listen, really listen to those I want to build a great relationship with. Help me to listen with my eyes. I want to commit to at least five to ten minutes a day with each person. Just listening, getting to know them. It's just a starting point. And in the weeks ahead, we're going to look to building some more parts of how to build a great relationships. But the starting point is here because love is patient. And say, Lord, help me to be patient as you're with me. 
And if you've never invited Christ into your life, then why don't you do that today? Because you won't be able to do it on your own. Say, Jesus Christ, come into my life and make yourself real to me. In Jesus' name. Father, now that we've learned about patience, I know you're going to test us this week with it. Help us to smile as we remember how patient you are with us. Help us to realize that we're all different, that we look at the world different. We have different perspectives. We have different opinions. And you've made us all different because it takes different people to fulfill your mission and reach the world with the gospel. So Lord Jesus, as we go throughout this week, I pray that you will help us to love like you do and to model your patience as we walk slowly through the crowds this week. In Jesus' name, amen.